Hello and welcome to the Guitar Summer Masterclass for Canon Music Camp 2021. Canon Music Camp is the premier comprehensive music camp in the Southeast. And Canon Music Camp is a three week music filled retreat in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina with intensive college preparatory work in performance and music theory, just in case you didn't know much about Canon. So welcome to the masterclass. My name is Robert, but my students call me RJ. I have been teaching guitar and music theory at Canon Music Camp for five years and have taught music theory, guitar, and music history for 12 years. Currently, I am finishing a PhD in music theory and music history. I began playing guitar when I was 13 years old because my dad is a guitarist and I wanted to learn his skills. And I love the sound of all styles of guitar. I decided to pursue a career in music because nothing brings me greater joy than performing music, teaching music, and writing about music. So what is a masterclass? Well, a masterclass is an opportunity to learn from a distinguished performer who is not the student's usual teacher. When in person or live, a highly proficient artist or teacher uh, works with one student and or a small ensemble in front of an audience. This provides a learning opportunity for performers and observers alike. So why attend a masterclass? Well, new ideas are often presented to the student and concepts are often expressed in a different manner from what the students are accustomed to, often resulting in an aha moment and or experience that promotes artistic growth. Because again, this is uh, you receiving input uh, from a fresh perspective, uh, who is the master musician of the moment. Masterclasses provide a new way of experiencing music for performers and audience members alike, and they're a chance to see the master teacher at work. And masterclasses are a great opportunity to network with fellow performers and teachers. how to prepare for a masterclass. We want to polish the piece to the best of our ability and know the score thoroughly. This is extremely important because you want to be prepared to stop and start at any place in the score. This could be the middle of a phrase, uh, the middle of a measure, uh, you know, anywhere in between. So you really want to know the music intimately and not only have it memorized, but know where the, the music is on the score at all times or know where you are in the score at all times. And in order to do this, um, it's also good to number your measures for reference, especially for ensemble masterclasses. Uh, what you'll find is you'll be in a masterclass and uh, the teacher will say, all right, turn to measure 41. Well, if you don't have your measures numbered, then you're going to have to be thumbing through and you might cause delays. And it's just better for everyone to literally be on the same page, right? And to do that, we need to make sure our measures are numbered. So important to be prepared to accept criticism in front of an audience and to respond in an open and engaging way. Remember that it's all about the music. Remain positive and enthusiastic at all times. We're here to promote the art and to promote artistic growth and creative growth. Um, so, you know, it's very important that in these moments when we're in front of a, a crowd or a classroom of people and we are being critiqued on our playing, we can't take that personally. This is a learning experience for all of us, not, not just you, but everybody that's in attendance, right? So this is uh, something that is uh, special in that way. Be ready to perform or discuss any aspect of your playing. This goes for technique, sound, and just overall performance. All right. Uh, for instance, how you walk onto the stage or how you uh, go to for classical guitar, how you go to sit down and, and, you know, achieve your posture. Right. All of these things are under scrutiny um, just as much as your technique and sound. So today's goals are going to be tips on daily practice routines to prepare for back to school this fall and for beyond, of course, uh, summer care and maintenance checks on your guitar to ensure great music making experiences. 
I'm going to uh, talk about preparing for auditions for school, county, district, and state level events. Uh, this is a little bit different for guitar uh, because we don't have the sort of all state uh, kind of groups um, and opportunities that many uh, band instruments have. But nonetheless, uh, we do have audition pieces and we do, many of us have uh, jazz combos or jazz band in high school. Uh, we're also going to talk about listening to quality recordings of audition materials. It's so important that we make sure that we're um, enriching ourselves with quality recordings from very uh, high level players. All right, this is who we want to learn from. This is who we want to in take our inspiration from. And finally, we're going to just talk a little bit uh, at the end uh, of, on how to understand or, or interpret a jazz chart score um, and suggestions for individual interpretation, uh, such as uh, melodic ornamentation. So practicing during the summer. Let me go back a little bit. Practicing during the summer. The most effective practicing maintains a balance of technique and repertoire. Uh, and my kind of rule of thumb here is that whatever the length of your practice session, one hour each day minimum, giving yourself one day a week break, um, but always try a strive to achieve an approximate 30-70 split between technique and repertoire. So if we're going to be practicing, say, uh, one hour a day, right, um, then we're going to want to put at least 20 minutes of that one hour into technique. That would be achieving approximately the 30-70 split. And we always want to begin our practice session with our technique uh, and technical work to ensure that your repertoire is practiced with proper technique. It's so important to do that. Always start with technical practice when you can, because again, that, that prepares you and that uh, conditions you to play your technique with uh, impeccable, or play your repertoire with impeccable technique that you have practiced, right? You wanna also communicate with your teacher or school instructor to find out what the repertoire for the upcoming year will be so you can get a jump start. Uh, we always want to be prepared as musicians. We always want to um, be looking at the next piece to learn. This makes us not only better at our instrument, but uh, more efficient learners of repertoire. Right? We also want to pick a piece of music that we love and would like to learn. This goes uh, beyond that uh, repertoire that your school might have you learn or that you might be learning for an audition. Um, I want you to pick just one, maybe two pieces of music that you just want to learn and that you love and that you just can't get out of your head, for instance. Um, summer is the perfect time to refresh our love for music and the creative spirit. Some more tips on practicing during the summer. If you're playing in a jazz combo or small ensemble, make sure to coordinate your joint practice sessions so that you can practice performing and improvising together, especially in the off season. Um, it feels great to come back to, to the semester, you know, uh, feeling invigorated and, and being in communication and, and using music as a language between each other before you step back into the halls. That way you get started on the best foot possible. Um, if coordinating with fellow ensemble members is not an option, I would like you to play with a backing track to practice uh, your chord comping and your improvisation. Many of uh, these backing tracks are completely free on YouTube. Uh, for instance, if we were going to look up uh, the Summertime backing track, which is one of the tunes that uh, we're going to talk about today in the masterclass, we would go to YouTube and type in Summertime uh, George Gershwin Jazz backing track. And that would bring us to a number of backing tracks. And uh, you can choose uh, ones that, you've, that are specific to your instrument choice. Um, and you can also use YouTube uh, to s slow the piece down while not affecting its pitch. Uh, this is uh, possible using the settings option in YouTube. You can uh, slow it down to 50% or 75%, um, or of course go full speed, or you could even go a bit faster if you want to challenge yourself. It's totally up to you. Um, but I found this to be uh, a completely free and very useful feature. <clears throat> We're going to want to play for an audience as much as we can, anywhere we can, right? 
Uh, family and friends are wonderful listeners, and summer is a great time to cultivate your performance abilities. Uh, say you're going on vacation with your family, bring your guitar. Uh, you know, hang out outside and play the guitar for passersby, um, where no one's really paying attention, but you have an audience, right? These are excellent practicing opportunities um, that you can embrace during the summer, right? Uh, always practice with a positive attitude and a relaxed body and mind. This goes for all practicing. Uh, taking a short walk outside can release the day's tension so you don't bring it into the practice room. We really want to avoid bringing stress or anxiety or tension into the practice room because we then we practice that, right? We practice it into our repertoire and it will also affect our ability to focus when we're in the moment, right? We really want to be in the music when we're in the practice room. And so we want to reduce all possibilities of, of distraction or um, any sort of uh, you know, mental state that might pull us away from full, fully focusing on our creation and our art. Okay. Now we're going to talk a bit about practicing technique. I would like to introduce you all to a bit, um, a bit of technical practice that I teach all of my students and that I still do to this day. Uh, we're going to learn three ascending and descending slur patterns. Uh, slurs are uh, hammer-ons and pull-offs. We'll talk a bit about those and how to do them properly, as well as uh, good technique for the left hand, good position for the left hand. We'll also talk a bit about alternate picking uh, with scales um, and using alternate picking with the above exercises. Additionally, we're going to discuss uh, playing scales in triplets and playing scales and other uh, basic technical exercises uh, using speed bursts. So without further ado, let me get my metronome out. Because remember, it's so important. Um, of course, we all practice our repertoire with a metronome, but it's also so important to practice our technique with a metronome because it really builds that internal sense of time. Right? That's what we want to do in the practice room is, is build the, our core skills so that when we, go to be a, when we go perform, those skills and that foundation is so strong that we can create. Right? We don't want to be um, encumbered by, by having to count beats because we didn't practice with a metronome. All right. Make sure I got... Sounds like pretty good jazz tone. All right. So I'm now going to zoom in just a little bit so that you all can see my hand. OK. Left hand is all we really need to see for now. For the slur exercises, we are going to ascend using hammer-ons, like I said. So ascending, going, meaning ascending in pitch, and descending, going down the neck and descending in pitch. Okay, so the pattern is different, ascending in this, uh, from descending. All right. Uh, first, let's talk about uh, good left hand position. The best left hand position, you'll see this in all of the best players, it is a straight wrist with curved fingers, okay? We really want to maintain this position as much as possible. I mean, we can come out of it a little bit here and there, right? If I'm playing a chord, I might come out of it a little bit, but notice, it's still straight. I just, I just adjusted the angle to uh, be able to uh, get the chord, right? Um, so a straight wrist, curved fingers. Best left hand technique that we can have as far as position is concerned. Notice the curvature of the fingers. Now, I'm going to curve my wrist and straighten my fingers, which is poor technique. Poor technique. And uh, I'll show you how difficult it can be to um, have facility on the neck. Okay, so now I'm going to curve my wrist, straighten my fingers. Notice that I'm overextending here. And so when I go, when I use my fingers, to press the strings down, I don't have the same sort of maneuverability and flexibility. Notice my pinky is almost perfectly straight here. And so I'm going to end up 
plucking other strings or dampening other strings because I don't have the curvature necessary to be accurate in my uh, depressing of each string. Furthermore, when we have our wrist curved like this, it increases the potential. Um, in fact, it, it guarantees a high level of fatigue in the wrist, and you'll feel it right in this area above the the back of the or above the wrist here, or the back of the wrist. Um, so we want to play with a straight wrist and curved fingers because it also allows us to play longer. So it allows us to play more cleanly, and it increases our endurance on the instrument. So, ascending, let's talk about uh, hammer-ons. Hammer-ons, just like they sound, is when we uh, pluck the string and then use a finger on the left hand to hammer down to make it sound like an articulation. I Notice, I did not pluck with the right hand. Okay? Now, a pull-off uh, is almost the exact opposite. Rather than hammering on, we're actually pulling off. It's a bit misleading because a pull-off is more of a pull-down. Notice. Okay. Again, notice that I only pluck once. And then I, I have another pluck with my left hand on, this, on the fretboard here. Okay. Notice that I pull down and not out. Okay. Pulling out does two things that are not good. Uh, first, pulling out pulls our hand out of position. Notice that if I come far away from the strings with my left hand fingers, that means I have to go back just as far. Not only increasing the distance, but increasing the potential uh, for uh, in an, an inaccurate move, right? The farther we go, leave, the farther we have to come back, and the greater potential there is, or the greater risk there is for us to uh, have error. Okay, so hammer on, pull off. Now this pattern, the first one here, one, two, three, four, that's ascending, and four, three, two, one, that's descending, goes as follows. One, two, three, four. Okay, all hammer ons. Descending is the opposite. Pull offs, four, three, two, one. Okay. So let's start a metronome and let's practice going uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, up to the fifth position. Okay, and then we'll descend. For all three, we'll go through the same um, distance, okay? So let's do that together. I'll set my metronome. And we'll play it to the eighth note. One and two and one and two and one and two and. Descending. Moving on, ascending one, three, two, four. Again, these are fingers in the left hand, so finger one is index, finger two is middle, finger three is ring, and finger four is pinky. Ascending one, three, two, four. Now it's important to uh, mention at this point that when I'm plucking, or when I'm, excuse me, when I'm uh, hammering on, notice when I hammer on with my third finger, my first finger can be a little bit more relaxed. I don't have to keep it attached or keep it pressing down because I'm using my third finger to articulate. So I can actually pull it up a little bit. Notice. Okay, so we can think of it as a press and then a lift and a press and a lift, kind of this way, all right? Uh, let's do ascending one, three, two, four and descending four, two, three, one. Descending would be pull-offs in the four, two, three, one pattern. Four, two, three, one. Okay. Again to eighth notes. One and one and and and. Descending. 
descending. Good. Now let's do ascending one, two, three, two, three, four. This is a little bit different because we're going to re-articulate or pluck the string again with our right hand uh, at the uh, middle or the second group of three. So at each second group of three here for two, three, four, and on the descending three, two, one, we're going to pick again and then pull off. So pull off two, three, uh, hammer on two, three, four, and pull off three, two, one. It's easier to hear it than it is to explain it. Here you go. Ascending again. One, two, three, two, three, four. And descending. Four, three, two, three, two, one. Four, three, two, three, two, one. Okay. Let's do this together, going up to the fifth position. One and two and one and two and one and two. Descending. Good. Now we're going to talk about alternate picking scales and above exercises. Alternate picking is something that we always want to be uh striving to do okay now for those that don't know what alternate picking is when we go down when we pluck we can pluck down or we can pluck up alternate picking essentially means that we for every down pluck there is an up okay so we don't repeat down strums or down plucks and we don't repeat up plucks unless they are uh followed immediately unless one down or up pluck is followed by it's uh, accompanying up or down. So what that turns out to be is simple up and down. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Okay, we want to keep this going at all times. And to uh, show what this would look like in a scale, I'll play a C major scale, just one octave ascending and descending. And you will see in my right hand here a constant down, up. Uh, which is alternate picking again. Okay, good. And uh, similarly, we want to practice scales in triplets with alternate picking. And that is simply creating a triplet out of the beat. So one, one, here's our beat, quarter note. If we're going to turn it into a triplet, we just divide that by three. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. Again, carrying on with the alternate picking in the right hand at all times. Now, speed bursts. These are uh, really important uh, and really useful to help build up our speed and our dexterity and our fine grain motor skills. Okay. Now, speed burst is essentially playing at one way to think about it is playing on in eighth notes. So if we're going with our scale, for instance, uh, 60 beats per minute, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four, always alternate picking. A speed burst would be uh, to, let me turn it off, would be to incorporate a, a triplet 
in the space of one quarter note rather than in two eighth notes. So rather than one and two and three and four and we will throw in a triplet um, at our uh, discretion or at our desire. So for instance, one and one, two, three, two, and this way, okay? I'll play what that sounds like. Remember, always alternate picking in the right hand. So here's our quarter note, one, one. And here's our eighth note, one and two and three and four and. And our, tri our triplet would be triple it triple it triple it triple it one and two and one e and okay one two three <laughs> We can also get creative with this and throw in uh, a speed burst that's four sixteenth notes instead of a triplet. For instance, notice how in the descending form of that scale I played. Uh, speed bursts and triplets and 16th notes, keeping that eighth note um, pulse steady or the quarter note pulse steady. Okay. Always practice with a metronome. All right, let's move on. Practicing during the school year. When the school year comes, we really want to make sure that we're maintaining the same balance of technical and repertoire practice as during the summer. Uh, but now we want to increase to two to three hours per day, if possible. I know that the school year can get a bit uh, busy, but I think it's really important to make sure that we increase our, um, our practice time with our instrument. Okay, And the best way to do that is to practice during the summer so that way when the school year comes, all you're doing is increasing a little bit. You're not going from zero to 60 all of a sudden, right? So it's very important to maintain your summer practice regimen. Um, but again, when the school year hits, bump it up to two to three hours per day if possible. Uh, wake up before school to practice, right? I know it seems early, but um, it, it'll actually pay off in dividends, uh, especially when you get to the college level or more advanced levels, um, because breaking up your practice times into manageable periods uh, ensures greater attention and faster progress. Uh, if you cannot seem to wake up early enough to practice before school or before you know your first commitment of the day, um, which your first commitment of the day should be practicing, um, but practice as soon as you get home and then practice again before dinner. Uh, Essentially, you want to make sure that we practice for, you know, a nice chunk, maybe an hour, hour and a half, give ourselves at least one to two hours, at least one to two hours of a break if we can, um, and then come back to the instrument, okay? That way, we're always kind of circling back around and keeping ourselves fresh, so to speak, rather than just one, two to three hour chunk a day, um, and then we have, you know, the other 21 hours of the day to, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, forget what we've done, right? So if we, if we intersperse our day or if we uh, put practice chunks throughout our day, then that means we're going to actually keep it more fresh, which means that we will be able to have greater attention and faster progress. Okay. Last but not least here, and I'm going to continue to keep coming back to this because I, I truly believe that it's uh, one of the most important things that we can do for ourselves. And this is all up to us, but always practice with a positive attitude and relaxed body, mind, and spirit, okay? Taking a short walk outside can release the day's tension so you don't bring it into the practice room. Um, when we go into the practice room, we're doing just that. We're practicing. We don't want to practice being tense when we play. We don't want to practice being stressed when we play. The practice room or the uh, practice time is a sacred time for us as musicians and artists. It's a sacred time when we get to connect with ourselves. And it's our time when we get to 
you know, maybe shut the world out for a little while and connect with ourselves. And, and in order to really do that deeply and in, in the most meaningful way, um, also with the spirit of uh, greater attention and faster progress in mind, we want to release the tension before we get into the practice room. Okay. And again, we also don't want to practice that tension into our repertoire, right? If you're always going into the practice room, practicing like, right, you're going to, you're going to be uh, harboring that in your playing, right? Nice, smooth, um, relaxed playing, right? Carrying on. Caring and maintaining your guitar. So we want to replace the strings at least every three weeks or 40 hours of playing, whichever comes first. If you don't play, uh, or excuse me, if you play your guitar, you know, hours a day, you'll actually notice that within a week, your strings probably already need to be changed. Um, but if you're not, if you seem to, you know, be playing that one hour a day, maybe one and a half hours a day during the summer, Every three weeks is fine because again, that's approximately you know thirty to forty hours of playing as it is there. So whichever comes first, three weeks or forty hours of playing. Remember that which, with each string replacement, uh, be sure to wipe down your instrument with a lint-free cloth. Okay, uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, wiping off all the you know dust that's accumulated because that does, believe it or not, affect the sound. It's subtle, but it absolutely does. It also affects the way that our guitar looks and it feels. We want to we want to play with a beautiful instrument, just how we want uh, to play with a beautiful creative spirit, right? Um, and importantly, uh, if you do see a bit of residue that's accumulated on the body of the instrument or the fretboard, uh, which is to say, um, you know, maybe some stickiness from the fingers or some body oil or some sweat or something, get a very, very lightly dampened cloth um, and you can wipe it down there. Make sure it's not more than the slightest damp though because um, that extra moisture will actually soak into the guitar the body of the guitar and it will um, it will affect the way that guitar uh, lasts meaning it will uh, reduce its longevity okay? when not in use keep your guitar in a case with the relative humidity maintained at 45 to 55 percent uh, a guitar humidifier that can do this uh, is possible to be purchased at your local music shop for $20 or less. Preparing for an audition. In advance, uh, you want to make sure that you memorize the music and all fingerings. Be able to play the music without staring at your fingers or hands. All right? You want to be uh, showing um, confidence, as we'll see a bit later here down the down the line of what we want to do. But um, you know, staring at your hands the whole time uh, doesn't allow you to connect with your audience, right? As performers, we are externalizing the music because, it, again, it's performance. It's a sonorous art. So staring at the hands the entire time you play removes the connection that you can have with your audience. And the, the judges or whoever is watching your audition will notice that. Um, and it also shows a bit uh, too much of a reliance on the visual um, relationship to the hand movements and the music itself. Again, music is, is something we hear. It's not something we see. Perform your audition in front of a mirror uh, and or for friends and family. Okay, it's so important because when you get to the, the moment of the audition, you want it to be like, you want it to feel like you've done it a million times, all right? One way to help ensure that that's, that experience will be possible is, to, performing, is to, to perform your audition in front of a mirror and for your friends and family, all right? They're the best audience, I promise. Get a good night's sleep the night before your audition, right? I know that goes without being said, but it's so incredibly important to get that good night's sleep because when you wake up, you want to feel refreshed. You don't want to feel stressed or groggy or hazy, anything like this. We want to, we want to have a clear mind, bright eyes, um, and ready to walk into that, the audition and really display what we're, what our abilities are. Okay. The day of the audition, have a good breakfast. Don't have too much coffee. 
right? For those of you that drink coffee or drink uh, caffeinated beverages. Try not to drink too much of that. It'll make you jittery, as you know. We all know what it feels like to drink too much coffee. Um, but it's also easy to have a little bit too much on a day that we're excited about something, right? So make sure you're, you're in touch with your or intention here, with, which your intention being to have a great audition. And to have a great audition, you should have a light warm-up, right? Remain stress-free, positive, and envision the brilliant playing that you will display. This bit about having a light warm-up we'll come back to um, in just one or two more points, but it's very important that you don't overdo it, on, uh, overdo it with playing on the day of your audition. Trust yourself. Trust in your preparation and trust that you will have a great audition. Confidence is important to display in any audition. You put the work in. You put the time in. You put the effort in. You put the love in. Now it's up to you to trust yourself and know that the work that you put in will show and it will pay off. One way that you can help make sure that that work pays off is to avoid a full practice session the day of, okay? And avoid overplaying your audition repertoire the day of your audition. So important. Uh, it's, it's like looking at a beautiful piece of art, right? If you look at a beautiful piece of art five times in a row in the same day, it will mean a little bit less every time, okay? Similar with your experience with playing the music. You go from being very aware and uh, of what you're playing to almost going on autopilot because you just know the music. So you're, you are literally just m getting through the piece using muscle memory, right? If you played it already five or six times that day. Right? So you want to you wanna be present with the piece, and also part of that uh, ability to be present with the piece and only playing it once um, the day of your, your recital or audition or whatever it might be, um, part of playing it only once is trusting yourself that you know it well enough to play it only once, maybe twice, if that, before the, the, on the day of the audition, just before your audition. All right, so all of these things are kind of wrapped up into one. Um, and a great, a great kind of bottom line here is to just trust in your preparation, okay? Let's talk a bit about how to practice sight reading. Begin with a single line melody in keys that have zero to three sharps or flats. All right, we don't want to overwhelm ourselves with accidentals or having to think about, um, oh, in the key of A flat, oh gosh, I have four flats. Right, we don't want to have to think about that stuff consciously as we're sight reading. We want that to be automatic. So when we see the note on the page, we want to know where that note is or that pitch is on our guitar. All right, we don't want to have to think, A, no, A flat, no, A sharp. Right, we want to really know um, all of the pitches in the key that we're working in, okay? And that is also to say we want to know the, both the major and relative minor, all right? It's so easy to just practice all major key melodies. It's so easy to do that. I'm, I was guilty of it too at one time. Um, and then, I, you know, over time you realize that major key melodies is only half the music out there, maybe even less. So it's important that we... Um, always practice in parallel the major and its relative minor at the same time if you can, okay? Um, and if you think about it, if you practice the keys with zero to three sharps or flats, major and relative minor, you're halfway there already, right? So there's a, a, a lot of, of good that comes from practicing the minor keys. So remember to do that. Um, and once you've mastered the first uh, three accidental either way on the circle of fifths, sharp or flat, move on to other keys. Always start with a slow tempo. Don't, uh, don't be overconfident when you're in the practice room sight reading. Accuracy is what we strive for with sight reading. Okay? To get 80% of the pitches right at 80 beats per minute, is not as good as getting 100% of the pitches right at 60 beats per minute. I, I assure you that in an audition, if you if that was the case, you hit 100% of the notes at 60, but only 80% at 80, you would 
the 60 beats per minute at 100% accuracy is always going to be the best way to go. So take accuracy um, and reliability and confidence over, oh, I think I can play this a little bit faster this time because my nerves are a little bit up, right? It's so easy in an audition to um, think we can take things a bit faster, right? It, our repertoire included. So don't, uh, don't trick yourself in that way. Stick to uh, slow and steady wins the race and build it up slowly, increasing by five beats per minute or so upon your success rate and comfort level. Right, and don't practice the same sight reading piece twenty times because you're no longer sight reading. Right, so it's important to also remember that when we're sight reading, we want to keep it sight reading. We want to keep it at uh, the sight reading level, which is repertoire that we haven't uh, read a lot of. Right, practice sight reading music in different time signatures. Uh, this is so important for the same reason that practicing uh, sight reading in different keys is important. Um, if you always practice melodies in 4-4, four, four, then when you're presented with a melody in 6-8, you're going to want to naturally group that in 4, especially if you're under some sort of pressure or uh, stress of being in an audition, uh, because that's what you practiced. And that's a beautiful thing, because that shows you how strong practicing, how strong, how strong the pathways are, right, in your practice session. If all you practice is 4-4, four, four, you're going to be excellent at 4-4. Four, four. But you might not be so good at six eight. Why not be good at all of them, right? That's that's what the best musicians do. Okay, they practice in every key and they play in all of the time signatures that they can. Okay. Finally, we want to be diverse in our sight reading selections. The music you use to practice sight reading should come primarily from the genre that you are studying, but should also include music from other styles and genres. Okay. This will ensure that your skills are well-rounded. For example, knowing how to sight read a piece of swing music or bebop music, you would know in an audition that you need to swing those eighth notes. Practicing sight reading something in the bossa uh, genre, which is a, a kind of a subgenre from Brazil, you know that those pitches need to be played a bit more strict. All right. So being omnivorous is a good term to use here in your uh, choice of uh, sight reading will ensure that your skills are well-rounded. And this has it all, all to do with the fact that music is a language. The more you expose yourself to the diversity of the language, the better you are off. Okay. The better off you are. Carrying on. So here we're going to talk about Three pieces of music. We'll start with Blue Monk. Um, I will play each of them at the end. Uh, so there will be a little uh, appendation toward the end of this uh, masterclass with each of the videos. So do stay tuned or fast forward to the end uh, of the masterclass if you want to uh, see me play the music as written on the page. Okay. Um, but in, in each of uh, these three pieces, I have a bit of commentary that I want you all to either be aware of or ways to practice, a way to improvise, or what the value of this piece is in an audition. Um, so again, the first piece that I've chosen is Blue Monk by Thelonious Monk. This is a very common audition piece at the middle school level and a bit above because it shows the ability to perform 12-bar blues form and swung eighth notes. Okay. Um, there's also a bit of syncopation here, so it also uh, shows your ability to uh, play syncopation in the jazz style. And with that being said, we want to be aware of the syncopations in this melody and play them accurately. We also want to be aware of the triplet in measure 8, as we'll see on, in the score on the next page. Uh, we want to remember the E diminished 7 chord in measure 6. This is almost a um, stereotypical jazz blues almost, uh, or excuse me, almost a stereotypical 12-bar blues. Uh, but there's that E diminished 7 chord in measure 6 that um, we were not expecting if we think that it's a, a, just a typical 12-bar blues. So that's something that we need to be aware of. We want to use an accompaniment pattern that emphasizes the quarter note beat and, and also uh, is aware of the stress on 2 and 4 in this style. So what do I mean by that? I'll play a quick example so that way uh, we can see in the moment, but you'll hear it uh, in a minute with uh, my playing of this piece. 
Um, so we're in the key of B flat. If we're playing a quarter note uh, accompaniment pattern with jazz, it's exactly as it sounds. So one, two, three, four. We turn up just a little bit. One, two, three, four. Notice that I am articulating every quarter note. Okay, I'm not missing a quarter note. I'm really there and steadily uh, part of the pulse. We want to practice improvising over this piece using the B flat major scale with a flat seven scale degree added. Okay, this is the major scale. Uh, we'll pl I'll play it in B flat. Okay. If we lower the seven, that means we're going to have a chromatic pitch between scale degree six and natural seven, or in, in major, right, the raised seven. Okay. This is also known as the bebop scale if we play it descending. I've provided the original version by Thelonious Monk and the jazz guitar version or a jazz guitar version by Chris Whiteman. Uh, it's also important to mention here that much jazz guitar music that we learn as jazz guitarists uh, is and was written for an instrument other than guitar. For instance, Thelonious Monk was a jazz pianist, a very important one, by the way, in the formation of bebop and, and early uh, bebop style. Um, but the jazz guitar didn't come in until a little bit later, and it plays more of an accompanimental role oftentimes. Um, and so there's not a lot of uh, jazz guitar standards that are written for guitar itself, with the exception of a couple West Montgomery tunes um, and some other really important folks like Joe Pass. Um, so when we're learning these pieces, we're often learning, you know, a saxophone melody, or in this case, again, a piano melody. So it's, uh, it's important to listen to those original recordings so we can get the feel of that music, all right? The piano plays it differently than you might on a guitar, and you want to try to emulate that as the p performer, which Chris Whiteman does an excellent job doing that. So I hope you enjoy that recording. Moving on. Here's the music. Just a couple of things that I wanted to point out uh, for everyone to be aware of. Uh, the syncopations here. Notice the, the tied pitches. We have another tie across the measure here. Ah, and we have this syncopation, this descending um, melody here with syncopation. You see? So this is an excellent tune to show your ability to uh, play syncopation in the style, as I said. Here's the triplet that I wanted to draw your attention to. And here is that E diminished seven chord that can kind of catch you by surprise if you're not paying it, if you're not looking for it or you're not aware of it and know that it's there. Okay. Moving on to our next piece. The second piece I've chosen for today is Summertime by George Gershwin. Uh, this is one of the most recognizable jazz tunes and popular audition piece at this level. Uh, Summertime is also a great introduction to jazz guitar because the melody, with the exception of one note, um, comes from the minor pentatonic scale. You can use the same A minor pentatonic scale to solo over the whole tune when first exploring jazz soloing. Okay. Remember that this is a 16-bar blues form, not a 12-bar blues like Monk. So this is this has an additional four measures, and another reason why I, I made it uh, this the high school nine to ten level. Um, oops, because it's a bit longer of a piece, um, and it has a couple of more chords in it. Uh, be aware of the two-beat pickup and the syncopation in measures eight and nine. 
this relatively simple melody lends itself well to exploring ornamentation. And you'll see that in the original, uh, quote, original version by Gershwin um, and the jazz guitar version by Wes Montgomery. Also note that these recordings uh, are in B flat minor, not A minor, okay? You'll notice that the tune I've give, provided for you is in A minor. Here is the two note, the two beat pickup that I want to draw your attention to. Okay. And here's the bit of syncopation that I wanted to draw your attention to as well. Okay. We have it starting here at the end of the second line. And notice how kind of simplistic this melody is and, and how these notes are uh, very much long. We have uh, a bit of rhythmic activity, then a held note, then a bit more rhythmic activity, then a held note, more rhythmic activity, held note. So these offer us opportunities to embellish the melody or ornament the melody, as you'll hear, like I said, in Wes Montgomery's version. Moving on. The final piece we're going to talk about today is Blue Bossa by Kenny Dorham. This is one of the most recognizable bossa nova tunes. Uh, blue bossa is a common audition piece at this level because it shows ability to comp and solo in this jazz style. We want to remember to start with the quarter note pickup, and we want to remember that bossa nova generally does not swing like other jazz styles. We want to perform the rhythms a bit more strict to get into the groove, as we'll see in the performance. The fingers of the right hand, not a pick, most often not a pick, are used to pluck the strings in a syncopated pattern that alternates between the thumb and other fingers, as you'll see in the video. It is most important to keep the bossa rhythm going when comping. Choosing the appropriate chord voicing will help maintain your bossa rhythm. Be aware of the 2-5-1 progressions in measures 5 through 8, 9 through 12, 13 through 15, and the final two measures, which is a turnaround. These are great opportunities to practice and showcase your 2-5-1 patterns or riffs in your solo. I provided a version by Dexter Gordon, uh, who's a saxophonist, to uh, give you all an idea of what uh, some great 2-5-1 patterns sound like. And here is the score. You'll notice again the two five one patterns that I want to draw your attention to here. Two, five, one. We have another two five one in D flat major. Two, five, one. We have another uh, two five one here in C minor. Two, five, one. And believe it or not, a uh, a little two five pattern here. Two, five, and of course, ending on one with the repeat. Also do notice that the melody modulates. We, we go to a different key here. We're in D flat major, so we have the addition of D flat and G flat. Keep watching to see the videos uh, of the three pieces, um, but thank you so much for your time. Uh, you see my email listed here on the page. I look forward to seeing you next year at Canon. Thank you so much for watching. All right, let's begin with Blue Monk. I'll play the chords first and I'll play the melody second. Uh, listen for the quarter note comping pattern when I'm uh, playing the chords and listen for the swung eighth notes when I play the melody. I'll count us in and adjust the screen just a little bit so you can see my hands. One, two, ready, and...
and now the melody. Uh, some beginning guitar players like to play this in the open position. But I personally think that it's best for our development if we play it all on the fretted, um, play all the pitches fretted, okay? So that would mean starting on the fifth, uh, in the fifth position on the A string, okay? Now, if we play this melody without swung eighth notes, it sounds very different. I'll show you what I mean. I'll count, I'll count in. One, two, ready, and. Okay. If we swing our eighth notes, it really gives that sense of jazz time. And it's very stylistic. Count us in again. One, two, ready, and. Let's talk a little bit about summertime. I'll play you the melody today um, and bring a couple of things to your attention. Uh, the first of which is that two beat pickup. Um, just be sure to when you're, that when you're counting in, you come in on uh, beats three and four if you're counting in uh, a four count. Um, and the melody, remember, is an A minor, and you can use the A minor pentatonic scale to improvise. I'll move the camera a bit for a better angle, and I will count us in. One, two, All right, let's move on to blue bossa. We'll start with the chord comping pattern, uh, which I will go through twice. So I'll play through the entire form two times, all right? Uh, and I want you to be listening for the alternating bass uh, notes that I'm playing with my thumb, okay? That's all the thumb that's playing the bass notes and the rest of the chord is plucked with my right, the rest of the fingers of my right hand. I'll again move the screen down just a bit so you can see my hands and I'll count us in. One, two, three, four. All right, let's talk about our last melody of the day, and that is Blue Bossa. Um, just a couple of things to be aware of is the first uh, pickup there that we see before measure one. Uh, we also have a modulation to the key of D flat major in the third line. You'll notice the addition of the D flat and G flat accidentals. And we have a bit of syncopation to be aware of, uh, especially in the descending lines here. So I'll count us in. One, two, 
One, two, three. 